My name is Myra West Allen. I am one of the catechists in the OCI program. I teach Bright, the class for elementary and middle school age children who have developmental disabilities. And I've taught every grade from three-year-olds on up. So um, they think I know a little bit about this. I'm not sure that's true. So I think everybody should have three a packet, stapled, and then two single sheets. Is that true? Really? Here's our agenda. We'll begin with the prayer in just a minute. But... Okay, see this is the wrong one. Every time I do this presentation, the wrong thing comes up. So we're gonna be in for a surprise because who knows what's gonna be. <laughs> okay, these are our objectives. You're gonna be able to define the terms evangelization and catechesis. Very simple terms, big words, but very simple. Recognize the mission of evangelization, identify your call to ministry, and the six tasks of catechesis, and reference sources. All right, for the M&Ms, or the Skittles, whatever you took, pick your favorite color, and then you're going to tell us about this. I'm being filmed, so I have to smile even when my grandchildren come in and get on my nerves. Uh -huh. Hey, go back to where you're supposed to be. Yes, go. Go. All right, so you're gonna go around the room, tell us what color you got, and you're gonna tell us your favorite Bible verse, your best teacher, your worst teacher. This is coming from not what I did. Your best teaching experience, whether you gave it or received it, we're good. Yellow is the most difficult thing Christ told us, and green is the Beatitudes or the Ten Commandments, which is easier to follow. So, somebody can volunteer and then you can pick the next person, but you're just going to give us your name, what you're going to be teaching, and then which color you picked. Yes, sir. My name is Alan. I used to teach uh, Sunday school at Our Lady of the Mountains uh, up in Cape Georgia. Tiny, tiny, tiny church. So tiny that um, I had to teach uh, catechism classes in the priest's uh, kitchen. And he would have to leave his bedroom and whiz all around us to, to get the mass. I love it. Over here in the corner. No. Uh, uh, I give a card to those kids so they could have a full box. And the most amazing experience was uh, that the choir, instead of giving um, a, a, a card to those kids, they came in and they sang their uh, greeting of support. 
And this was a tiny kitchen, and this choir just crammed in there. And it was just such a beautiful, beautiful experience. It was, and they, they raised the roof. Great, great, thank you. You can pick on someone else. <laughs> Let's see, I guess Blue, the best teaching experience, I guess. Um, oh, my name is Kat, and I teach a uh, Sunday five-year-old kindergarten class, and um, we were talking about prayer and how you can, you know, the Sunday cross is a prayer, singing is a prayer, and so I said, I think we should make up our own prayer for the class, and we made up a prayer, but it was about all the things we're thankful for, and we got paper plates, and I had the kids draw, you know, like, whatever. Like, the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, flowers, the dogs, whatever. And we put a, you know, we do the pictures and then attach it to the, um, like, full craft sticks. And so we said the prayer, like, going around the room. And I said, you know, and we just continued around. And they, they thought that was cool because they got to color and draw, and it was all part of the prayer. So they thought that was good fun. And even my 11th and 12th graders like the color that you cut out. So it's a craft for all ages. Pick someone. Hi, I'm, I'm Mark Zoller. I am I'm teaching well, this third grade uh, this year. My wife and I taught our younger daughter's uh, second grade prep class last year, so that was our first experience, but it was, it was a good one. So we're, we're uh, re-upping. And uh, so I have yellow, and I think the most difficult thing Christ told us was to love our enemies and and to forgive those who do harm to us. You can pick on someone else. Uh, you have a kind face. <laughs> I'm going to pick on you. My name is Maureen. Um, right now I am teaching school for vacation Bible school. I'm going to be teaching first grade this year. I chose orange, best there. teacher, and I would say um, the best teacher I ever had was my ninth grade teacher in high school. I went to Catholic school all before then, and then I went to public high school, so it was, to me it was very difficult. I went from 300 students to almost 2,000, and she really went out of her way, not just in ninth grade, but my whole um, high school career to just kind of keep up with all of us. Pick on someone. No, if you're leaving, leave. Oh, no, no, I was going to stay to close the thing up, but I was, I was supposed to be able to get in that room that's locked. They're supposed to be sitting in the kitchen. In the kitchen? Well, mm -hmm. the kitchen would work fine for me. Okay. okay. Thank you. Select. Hi, I'm Carlos. Um, I teach the Spanish OCI in the Washington uh, Middle School. Um, I chose or, uh, yellow and the reason was because one of the most difficult things Christ told us or taught us is how to be humble. Um, I think that that's something that we struggle from day to day, especially in today's society. Thank you. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're the last one. Yeah. Did you think walking in and just sitting down was going to exempt you? No, 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 no. You can pick one of these colors. Tell us your name, what you're teaching or not teaching, or, and then one of these. Feel your pain. <laughs>
Just pick a color. Don't worry about what it says. What's your favorite color? And, you know, I know it's redundant, but, you know, this OCI client really does a good job. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because it's easy, and, but, you know, seriously, um, right coming out of OCI, I was just like Susan. I couldn't get enough of, you know, uh, you know, hanging out here and doing a lot of different things. And, you know, so, yeah, so there you go. Okay. Enough. <laughs> so as you can tell, we all have varied backgrounds and very things we do otherwise but as catechists we're all called to do one thing and that is to evangelize those we encounter especially those who are in our classes but before we get to that oh i forgot we have to pray i remembered it over there and then i forgot and then i in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless us all. We ask that you open our hearts and souls to allow the Holy Spirit to work within us. Our vocation is catechists, and we want to be able to be that model and example that the disciples were and that Jesus is. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, I gave you, yes, this is the right one. <laughs> you have a sheet, you can work together, but in your packet, on page two, oh, well, darn, <laughs> you have the terms. <laughs> well, that make it easy. Oh, yeah, but then I also gave you the definitions, which I didn't really want to do right at this juncture. So. <laughs> Those terms go with these sets of pictures. They're nine. So take about seven minutes. Work with your table, whatever. If you want to move and join a table, do that. I think I have now, after all the years of doing this, finally have the right types of photos. Hello? Are you still in Yes. Okay.
okay, <laughs> then I don't feel so bad. <laughs> All right, here are, there's no, you know, you're not getting graded for this. So those are the responses, at least in my view. <laughs> Probably the hardest would have been magisterium. And for whatever reason, a lot of people don't get that this is prayer. done this enough to know people prayer <laughs> well that's what the rosary is a prayer <laughs> does anybody have questions about why these pictures are what they are the authority to teach about the church which starts with the Pope and then the, that's a copy of the catechism and education it's all about educating One time I had a picture of just a teacher that didn't do well. <laughs> so. All right. What is catechesis? Basically, catechesis involves evangelization, which is preaching the gospel and converting people to Christianity. That might sound odd for us because everybody we teach is already Catholic or wanting to be Catholic. But evangelization is not standing on the street corner saying, God is going to send you to hell. That is not what evangelization is about. And back in the old days, because I'm pretty old, Catholics didn't like that word evangelization because for us it was those TV preachers, you know, telling you to send five dollars and they'll send you a cloth with their sweat on it and you'll be healed of all your whatevers. That's not what's, what it's all about. And since Vatican II, you know, the church has taken on the role of trying to educate us all in that evangelization means go out and spread the word. Be an example. I'm taking a catechesis class as we speak and one of the things about evangelization was, you know, the church says you meet people where they are. So regardless of who you're teaching, you meet them where they are. If it's a language issue, then you have OCIC in Spanish. If it's a cultural issue, then we have to adjust to the culture that we're experiencing. We cannot expect the people we want to evangelize to be like us. It is up to us to show them why Catholicism is meaningful to them. 
right where they are. And I think the best place you can see that is when you go down for the right of election. Uh, I've not gone in a million years, but when I went, you could see the diversity of the church because the people would come in their native garb. So you would have African dress, you had Korean dress, you had uh, some Hispanic dress, but wherever the people were from, that's how they dressed to go to the right of election. And that's when you get that impact that the Catholic church is so wide reaching. And that, you know, when you walk away from that, it's like, wow, really is something special. And I'm not going to read all of these to you. That's why I printed the PowerPoint. <laughs> but the bottom line is catechesis involves information, formation, and transformation. We get information and give that information. We use that to help them form their faith life. And somehow, as they're forming their faith life, transforming themselves. And we should be doing the same thing. We shouldn't experience something and think, or not think even, just go on la di da di da. Because the bottom line is we are the model for whomever we're teaching. So if Jesus wouldn't yell at my grandsons, then I have to work real hard to model not yelling at my grandsons in front of you. Because how can I say, Jesus loves everyone if I'm not providing that model for you. And it's hard. Let me tell you, the life of a Christian who's trying to live like Jesus is very hard. Well, let me correct myself. Very hard for me. Maybe the rest of y'all got this in the bag, but I struggle with this. And catechesis is just helping individuals acquire their faith. And again, transmitting the gospel. Everything about catechesis in the Catholic Church is about taking the message from the gospel, from the liturgy, and imparting it to others. Okay, I don't have the catechesis handout. I told you. It <laughs> All right, this is just a brief history of catechesis. Back in the old days, when I was growing up, it was called CCD. And it was different than the Baltimore Catechism. CCD was more user-friendly and, and regular language and just fun. The Baltimore Catechism, and I call myself a crack baby because I fell in that time period when the Baltimore was going away and CCD was forming. So I didn't get a whole lot of the um, Baltimore Catechism. The Baltimore Catechism was based on rote memory. You know, you learn something, it was a set of questions and answers, and take the Carter's in the kitchen, so take him. The Baltimore Catechism used the method of questions and answers. And since I didn't experience it, I cannot give you the correct answer. Who is God? You know, what is grace? Those kinds of things. The charismatic approach was early in the 20th century. And it grew because people were tired of the Baltimore Catechism. It was too dogmatic. So then we have the charismatic movement. But the problem with that was that there were too many loopholes, too many awkwardness. It just, it was not enough to move the faith forward. So, and then we have apologetics, which really isn't apologizing for anything. Apologetics is defending the faith. And uh, we did a lot of that when I taught 11th grade because 
uh, the kids would go to school and people always had something to say about the Catholic Church. And the kids didn't know what to say. So I was like, oh, well, let me give you the answer for defending the faith. Because Catholicism is not real big in the South. You can't count the Atlanta metro area. That's not reality. So in general, in the South, Catholicism is not the strongest suit. So hence, our young people need to know what they need to know so they can tell people who say, you worship statues. No, really, we don't. Some churches have lots of statues, and some churches have very few, and some churches have none. But we don't pray to statues. We ask saints to intercede for us. We don't ask that statue to do something for us. And if you have a saint that's your favorite saint, then you ask that saint to intercede for you on your behalf to God. Because the saint's not going to do it. It's God. And that's the bottom line. People don't recognize that it's God that is the end all and be all. If you have questions, stop me. Um, as I said at the beginning, yes. What? To pray to saints to intercede for us. Mm -hmm. Well, now, but in the early, early, early church, you know, when Luther got mad and did the, all his shouting and hollering, the church does not have a splendid history. And I don't want to go into history, but we were selling indulgences, uh, <laughs> we were selling priesthood. And we were doing things that were not Christ-like by any stretch of the imagination. So back then, yeah, they could have been praying to saints because somebody told them if they did that and gave them a quarter, you know, something magical would happen. Well, there's no magic. You know, this is all a faith-driven issue. And I love the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church does not have a crystal clean history. And as long as you know that and can move forward, you're fine. You know, there were the Inquisitions and the Crusades and all kinds of things. But where we are now is in a much better place. And we have a Pope who is fabulous and with any luck will move us further along that path. Okay? So vocation means calling, and we have seven sacraments, and two of them involve vocations. Does anybody know what they are? Marriage is one. Holy orders. Holy orders is the other. So just like they have a vocation to be married or to be in the religious life, nuns aren't ordained, but we also have a calling, I hope you have a calling, to be a catechist. Because some people think it's a volunteer, just simply a volunteer thing. We've been talking about this in class, and it's amazing how catechesis plays out in different parishes. You know, I think we have a pretty vibrant religious education program here from three-year-olds on. But not so much in some places. And sometimes they treat their, teach, their volunteers, their teachers, their catechists, eh, like it's nothing special. Now, I'm not saying that we're placed on pedestals around here, nor do I think we should be. But I think you all sense that 
people like what you're doing and want it to continue and that you're not doing a bad job. And that's what that's all about. And that's why we do these, these certification classes so you'll at least have a basic knowledge level of what it is to be Catholic. All of these qualities you have some way or another. You may not think you have them, but you do. I am sure that each of us can draw on, well, let me, let me back up. For each cradle Catholic, we can draw on something from our families that has kept us doing this. For everybody else, the converts, it would be there was something in your life, in your, somebody in your family, very few people do I meet going through OCI that had no religion in their family at all. So our families is what draws us to this. And family, the church says clearly, the family is the first step in the link, the path of religious education. The reality is, just like public school, some parents have the thought, you teach them. So that's why we have to be really enthusiastic and know and love what we're doing because we need to keep the kids involved so they can go on to continue to be involved. I'm not going through all these. You have them in your... Your primary mission is to communicate God's love. There is a difference between a catechist and a teacher of religion. What would Jesus do? Bye. 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 A religion teacher simply takes that textbook, opens it, and presents the information. A religion teacher just, there's no experiential dynamic to what is done. A catechist, you know, you don't have to spend 14 hours planning a lesson, but a catechist has some background knowledge and is inviting those students to be a part of the lesson on how they learn, what they've learned. It doesn't matter what level the kids are at. They all want to feel a part of the lesson. A religion teacher, probably like the worst teacher you ever had, just goes through that one by one. I take the book, I look at the lesson, and then I decide if I want to use parts of the lesson or if I'm going to go extemporaneously and do what I know. And you can do any combination of that. But don't stand in front of your room and just go through the book. It's amazing. You can get through the entire lesson without ever looking at the book. Now, it's your job to look at the book to make sure you know what you're going to cover. But you don't have to open the book and have the kids read and do all of that. And aside. Early on, you need to gauge whether your kids are readers or not, because you don't want to call on somebody who is a non-reader. It's painful, very painful. You don't want to do that, because even if they don't know they're not good readers, <laughs> it's hard to listen to. So try to get a gauge early on as to who are your readers and who are not or don't use the book to do that. And catechetical ministry is all of this. It's all of the religious education. If you go on the website for almost any archdiocese, you'll see something about the catechetical ministry, which is the teaching of religion to others. Your roles, your responsibilities, when we say you're supposed to teach as Jesus did, you know, what would Jesus do? Jesus taught in parables, and he taught in the type of parables 
that the audience he was talking to could understand. If he was talking to Pharisees, he would talk about Jewish law. If he was talking to farmers, he would talk about vineyards. If he was talking to fishermen, he would talk about fishing. When we're talking to our kids, we need to be engaging. We need to get them to be involved. The one thing Jesus did that most of, them, most of the Jews didn't like was there was the Jewish law and then there was their external actions. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the one where um, Jesus and the disciples are traveling and they go through some corn wheat field or whatever and they take something off the stalk and they eat it because they were hungry. And one of the Pharisees says, why do your people eat on the Sabbath? You know, you're not supposed to pick anything. You're not supposed to do anything. This is the Sabbath. And Jesus was like, really? Was I made for the Sabbath or the Sabbath for me? When they wanted to stone the woman who was caught in adultery. Let you who are without sin cast the first stone. Clearly, he's telling them, yes, there's a law, but you're not all living that law either. So we cannot impart to our students that this is what we're supposed to do if we're not doing it. It's very easy to talk the talk. It's much harder to walk the talk. And the one thing that keeps me going <laughs> is when I least expect it, one of the little kids will catch me someplace outside of church. And they rush up to you and, you know, I've either just yelled at the kids or I'm about to yell at the kids. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> hi, how are you? <laughs> so. As catechists, we're called to always be on alert. We're called to always model what Jesus would do. How hard is it for us to tell kids not to steal when we take a room paper from work or some pens or pencils or whatever? Stealing is stealing, however you want to count it. So we're also called to bring these people to conversion. They make that decision, not us. All we're doing is leading the horse to water. And when it talks about the way of the cross is developmental, our program is already, has already done that for us. The kids get what they can get at each age and developmental level. And if they stay in the program from three to 12th grade, they will have cycled through everything at least twice, some of them three times, but always at a level that they can understand at that particular moment in time. And we're always inviting them. Okay, I'm not reading all of this. It's in your, it's <laughs> in your packet. Our biggest task of catechesis is to promote knowledge of the faith, to teach our kids to pray, and be that missionary spirit. All of those things are built into the lesson plans. So what I'm saying is if you open the book and read the lesson and make it your own, you can present it any way you like. I open the book, I look at the lesson, then I do a PowerPoint, and then the kids and I go through it. They love it. Now, if you like to read and tell the Bible stories, do that. They, you know, the kids fall out when I read stories to them. It's, it's pretty sad. Yeah, because see, Miss Myra cannot get on the floor and move about like they do. So if Miss Myra gets on the floor, there's a lot of rolling around going on. All right, our sources of catechesis, the Bible, 
the liturgy, ecclesial things like church documents, and there are This is a wonderful little book. You don't have to buy it. I think Joyce probably has it in the office. But it's called The National Directory for Catechesis. And it goes through all the things that we need to do and be as catechists. And it talks about diversity and how to worship, the task of catechesis. All of that's in there. It is not bedtime reading. Well, yeah, if you want to go to sleep. <laughs> But actually, it's, it was interesting. When I saw it, I was like, oh. But it really is, call me a geek, interesting reading. And then the natural pace of life. Like everyone, I don't know if anybody went to the six o'clock mass after the Orlando shooting, but I think Monsignor did a fabulous homily. He got, he told 50, pe 50 people counted off, and they stood on one side of the altar and 53 stood on the other side. And this is summer at Transfiguration, so we probably only had 200 people in church. <laughs> but it was just amazing to bring that natural element of what was gone and what was not gone and how we're called to be forgiving. Father Fernando did the same thing at that Friday Mass for the victims of the shooting. And We are called to be forgiving. We are not to sit in judgment. And that's what a lot of us get caught up in is that we're being judgmental and it's, it's not our call, that's God's call. If the person jumps off the building and halfway down says, Father, forgive me, and is truly repentant, then he or she will be forgiven, bottom line. You know, if that person killed 49 people and had lived to say he was sorry. Of course, he wouldn't because God wasn't his thing. But anyway, if he did and he was truly repentant, God would forgive him. It's us that struggle with that whole judgment thing. And that is not our call. Okay, the different models include catechesis, which is what we're doing now, family. Again, family is the first step in the process. Uh, now we have this program here called Ruosh, which is a family religious education program. I think it's sixth, seventh, and eighth now. And uh, they do all their catechizing at home as a family, and they meet three or four times during the school year. But that's where the teaching goes on. The families love it. You know, initially, and it's not a huge number by any stretch of the imagination, but if you get a few people who are interested and they're willing to spread the word about it, that's catechesis. We also have where we use the lectionary and litur liturgy, which again is the readings from the day or Sunday, and mentoring. We have a mentoring program here. Kids in 10th grade are invited to participate and they get paired up with an adult. And for the next three years, they spend time talking about their different faith journeys. And if you haven't been a mentor, that's something to think about because that doesn't take a whole lot of your time. They meet three or four times a year and Talk, basically. That, you're talking about your faith life. And all the mentees I've had, we both learned something. My first mentee got into this big debate about confession. Why did she have to go to confession? Why couldn't she just ask God in her bedroom to forgive her? And I said, well, what sin did you do that only you and God saw. She couldn't get to that. Because we do not sin in isolation. It may not affect anyone directly, but you know, when you take that package of candy from the store without paying for it, 
well, they're going to increase the price to cover their losses. So sin is not done in isolation. It impacts people whether we think so or not. But that whole mentoring relationship is how you get these kids to open up and tell you what they think. And unless it's really, really wrong, you just share your experiences. So, you know, if you want a mentor, talk to Joyce. This, the socio-religious context is what I talked about at the beginning. You know, you meet people where they are. The, the, the fun fact I like to tell people is, whatever happens in society happens at transfiguration at the same rate. So, if 12% of the population are pedophiles, 12% of the population here. If 2% are wife beaters, they're here. You know, we need to get away from thinking that everybody who sits in the pews with us is perfect, just as we are perfect. <laughs> but, we have to educate ourselves and learn that we do not sit in judgment. Yes, there are legal remedies for most things, and they should be handled. But when those kids come into our classrooms and they are hungry or dirty or smelly or can't read, there's a real-life issue going on that needs to be addressed. And as catechists, we should not be afraid of addressing that issue. Probably every year I refer a kid for some reason or another. You know, you come every week and you're hungry and your parents say you've eaten. You know, I don't know, not my call. We're all mandated reporters, so if you suspect something, your job is to go and tell Sheila or Joyce. And that ends our obligation of mandated reporting. But there are homeless people who go to church here. There are hungry people who go to church here. So we can't deliver the message like it's normal for everyone. It's not. We have to meet people where they are. And, you know, we think we're in Cobb County and nothing bothers us. Well, there are illiterate people in Cobb County. There are homeless people in Cobb County. And many of them come to church here. So we're called to be that invitation for them to continue a faith journey. Okay, Thomas Groom was one of the biggies in uh, catechetical ministry. And he talks about depending on the Holy Spirit to help you in each lesson. So he says all our plans should include a Experience, message, discovery, and response. What experience goes with, you know, Mary being asked to be the mother of God? And what message do we take from that? And what do we discover? Just how strong Mary really was. And how do we respond to that? And even at first grade, Kids can all respond to the gospel message. And that's what we're called to try to elicit from them. Okay, you have a handout called Road to Emmaus. And it asks you some questions about your faith journey. So take a few minutes. You don't have to answer all of them.
is that handout? The black and white. Mm -hmm. well, we don't have the pastor mm -hmm. It's the road to Emmaus story. You know, Jesus is on the road. He meets the disciples after the crucifixion. And he tells them all about Jewish history and why things happened the way they happened. Where's my phone? Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them named Clophus said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sorts of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem where they found gathered together the 11 and those with them who were saying, the Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. That's the scripture.
Okay, you have to write something because somebody from your table is going to have to share. <laughs> 830 is on you. I'm out of tech in the kitchen, but I can't find that flash drive I just had. Do you want me to look in my office? Uh, it's not a crisis, but if you see it there, okay. I'll be there tomorrow. All right, the road to Emmaus. We have the human experience, the message, discovery, and response. Have we seen this tonight already? <coughs> what? I think if we go back and check, this is Thomas Groom. May not be the exact same words. So who would like to share the human experience? Okay. Uh, when they started, initially started their walk to Emmaus, and he asked them what were they talking about, what happened, and they explained their faith. Okay. Anybody get anything else? Mm-hmm. Exactly. All right. The message.
Hmm? No. Miss type A, no. Okay, we'll skip. When uh, I sponsor in OCI, I just happened to sit here and look at uh, that plaque all morning long, be open to the experience, and I can uh, relate to my candidate, and we'll be exchanging a, a, a vibrant uh, kind of dialogue back and forth. So the, the message is that it's really broad. Thank you. How about discovery? This is the dispersion of the bride. Mm -hmm. That's when they recognize. Engaging, um, being the teacher, leading the students, and kind of like that aha moment, like they're getting it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Finding the, the answer themselves sticks a lot better. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the main that can vary um, for this team. Do you have something, Mark? Um, Jesus conceals his identity. So, you know, so he, he was stepping back and letting them, getting out of the way. step in and say something or whatever. They'll hold them quiet and don't say anything. <laughs> then sometimes we have to Oh, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, if, if, uh, if you can get them to discover the answer, you can guide them in that direction. Say a word here or there. But if they realize it themselves through their own experiences that you started off with to begin with, then you Mm -hmm. So the message is that it lasts a lot longer. All right, and response. And if we, mm -hmm. if we ask, if we teach a lesson and ask the kids to, you know, tell their parents what they learned, they, you know, up to a certain age, they'll be glad to do that. <laughs> then they'll look at you like, I didn't learn anything. But that's okay. They did. They just won't tell you that. As we form as catechists, we're looking at three levels, the human level, the spiritual level, and the intellectual level. And these are the things that we need to be developing within ourselves so that we can enrich the lives of the people that we're going to be sharing the faith with. So we have to work on being virtuous and we have to reflect on the things that happen in our life. Um, I'm taking a class and I didn't know this prayer, the examine of conscious. Conscious? Yeah. It's not the examination of conscious. Yeah. And you stop a couple times during the day you know, if prayer is difficult, you might only be able to do this once a day. But you reflect back on the day, on the things that happened, 
the good things, the not so good things, and you try to figure out why you did or said certain things and what went well and thank God for it. And it helps us begin to refocus. And if we do this and we see the same things happening over and over again, then we know that's something that we really need to work on. So that might be something you would want to experience. Uh, I think the app Laudette has it, but I'm sure if you go on Catholic online, you know, you could find it. Yeah. Uh, we have to develop our spiritual life. And we have to understand and know church doctrine. And that goes back to taking classes like this, reading, looking at church documents. Some of them can be very dry, but most of them are full of information that you might not have known about. And you can always go to books like this. Um, there are lots of books out there. There are, you have to be clear on your websites. You know, some of them are, they say they're Catholic, but they're Catholic bashing. So um, the good sites usually come from the Conference of Bishops There's actually good stuff on YouTube. I <laughs> with my kids a lot. So, um, and I think Father Dennis has a website. Adore? Ardor. Ardor, Adore. You know, you know, close. Anyway, those are all places we can get information to help us keep current with our faith life. Then the heart, of the, ca the heart of catechesis is the heart of the catechist. Any questions? All right, we'll close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together this evening. We ask that you Fill these catechists with the fervor and zeal to go out and evangelize and bring the word of God to those they encounter. May we see God in all we encounter and may they see God in us. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son.